Hello, my name is Jörg Rieger, the J is pronounced like a Y, and I'm a professor of theology at Vanderbilt University. I'm also the director of the Wendling Cook program in religion and justice. We're focusing on issues of the economy, ecology, labor, and class in relation to religion. You'll see uh, the links to the Wendling Cook program on the screen, as well as my personal website. I've been working on issues of power and religion, um, specifically on matters of empire, economic, labor, and class. You can see some of my books on the topic here. And in this short presentation, I would like to talk about religion and deep solidarity. This term deep solidarity, I made up in response in the aftermath of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And you'll see in a minute uh, why that's important. Now, I realize that both topics, religion and deep solidarity, are a bit touchy today, and there are good reasons for that. We'll get into those in a minute. But let me also talk about why they're still crucial and important. First of all, solidarity is important because without it, we cannot fight or win the battles that we need to fight and that we need to win. Unfortunately, like with religion, solidarity has oftentimes been used by the right wing. Right wing solidarity is problematic for many reasons. It ignores the difference of people and it turns often into calls for uniformity, sameness, marching in lock, lockstep and so on. That's not what we mean when we talk about deep solidarity. Still, there are options for solidarity, which I want to explore in this presentation. Second, about religion. Religion is important simply because of what it does or does not do to people. You won't have to be a person of faith or a religious person to appreciate that and to see it. Religion, as many of us realize, has become a matter of life and death, has caused a lot of death, but sometimes it's also supported life and contributed to resistance against exploitation and oppression. So there's a reason for uh, seeing what difference religion can make today. And in this context, I also need to express an appreciation for atheism because atheism helps religious people to become clear about the deadly images of God. And in doing so, rejecting theistic images of God that kill, it can help create some space for a conversation about what images of God might actually be life-giving and conducing to a new way of life. In one of my books titled Jesus versus Caesar, I have argued that much of atheism is actually related uh, to some of the basic spirit of Christianity because it has very early on in Christianity helped against the struggle against empires. The other reason religion is important is because it plays a role in the lives of so many working people in the United States, because some of it can be organized for the good. There's a long history of religion and labor, for instance, that's being rediscovered and reclaimed today. And the Wendling Cook program in religion and justice at Vanderbilt is part of that. Let me start with some reflections on the importance of solidarity. You may have heard the saying that when the American left is asked to form a firing squad, it gets into a circle. Supposedly, Che Guevara said it, but we don't quite know for sure. There are reasons for that, and the fault is not always with the left. Divide and conquer methods are everywhere. Working people have been played off against each other in the US since before the arrival of the Mayflower. You might check out the work of the African-American historian, Lerone Bennett on that topic, who showed that in the early 17th century in Virginia, white and black sharecroppers were systematically played off against each other, which was in Bennett's account, the beginning of racism. And at the same time, uh, something happened that I oftentimes call unite and conquer because the white sharecroppers and the white masters were now united in such a way 
that actually helped conquer not only the black sharecroppers, but the white sharecroppers as well, because they didn't really benefit what they thought they would in this alliance. So in the end, uh, everybody was worse off. So how do we build solidarity in this context of divide and conquer and unite and conquer? The basis of deep solidarity is actually fairly simple. Let me quote Kianga Yamata Taylor from her book, uh, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. Taylor gets at it when she talks about a potential for solidarity that has to do with the fact that when one group of workers suffer oppression, it negatively affects all workers. This is what he calls the material foundation for solidarity and unity within the working class. According to Taylor, this pulls working people together in ways that actually go beyond the popular notion of allyship. Allyship, Taylor argues, doesn't quite capture the degree to which black and white workers are inextricably linked. Deep solidarity is about this inextricable connection of working people, which exists whether we know it, whether we acknowledge it or not. It's a very practical thing. It's not primarily a metaphysical concept. It doesn't need big concepts like human dignity or human rights. Maybe that comes as a disappointment to some religious people, but the practical foundation that's at stake here also resonates deeply with many religious traditions. In Christianity, for instance, Jesus's injunction to love God and to love one's neighbor as oneself is not just a great idea, but it is linked to a specific way of organizing people power. It's this practical interrelation that we're talking about. It's a new conversation in historical Jesus research, realizing that Jesus perhaps before all else was an organizer. A lot of his sayings actually make a lot more sense in this context. Love your enemy, for instance, uh, oftentimes quoted, makes more sense if it is part of forming solidarity among competing peasant villages. But be that as it may, it is this love your neighbor as yourself that could really be foundational for deep solidarity. Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher has put it this way. He says, love your neighbor as yourself means something like love your neighbor as being part of yourself. Your neighbor is already part of yourself, whether you know it or not. And the other Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas has talked about similar things. That is a good start for what we're talking about, but it doesn't quite take account into account the ways in which working people are welded together and exploited in capitalism. So deep solidarity is sort of this next step, talking about how working people are welded together, inextricably connected under the conditions of capitalism. That means there are some common concerns and interests at work, and maybe there are even some common sources of energy. So this is not just a moral idea, you know, imperative, you should be in solidarity, but it's talking about we're actually connected and maybe there's something to be gained. By the way, individualism in this context is really just the myth of the powerful. It's not a reality. It is the powerful telling everybody else that they have made it and then making everybody else think uh, they're just disconnected individuals while capitalism ties everyone together and makes sure that some benefit at the expense of others. So this connection, the other being part of us is actually deeply ingrained in our economic system. This is the basis of deep solidarity, this inextricable connection that Kianga Taylor talks about. Question is, what do we do with it? Some may remember that Karl Marx talked about class in itself and for itself, class in itself, talking about the simple fact that there are classes functioning in our economic system, whether we like it or not. And class for itself is building some awareness of this and making positive views, maybe fighting back if necessary um, against this problem. 
Today, I would argue that in the situation of COVID-19, we've seen things a little bit more clearly. There's not this popular notion of essential workers and essential work. That's where solidarity starts to shape, right? Uh, the system welds working people together, makes them essential. And this helps us reclaim two things that are too often forgotten. First of all, working people are not the exception, but the norm. They're actually the majority, depending on how you count. If you follow economist Michael Zweig, you could say working people are two thirds of the American population. If you follow the old Occupy Wall Street logic, you could say working people are the 99%, the 90% of us who have to work for a living. Working people are in the majority. The second point is work is often the place of the greatest diversity in the United States. So don't think of workers and the working class as white males in hard hats or something. Think of work and working people as the place of the greatest diversity that you can find in our society at the moment. And this is another one of the reasons why this is such a unique place for the production of deep solidarity, work and labor. Now, while the solidarity that forms among working people is deep, at the same time, it is also open-ended and values difference. This is how it is different from the right-wing ideas of solidarity that's about narrow identities or sameness, uniformity and uniforms and all of that. Deep solidarity as it emerges among essential workers recognizes that difference is absolutely necessary. So deep solidarity here talks and can imagine a central place of those who experience the pressures in their own bodies with their greatest intensities. It's clear in our society, it's the minorities, racial, ethnic, gendered, and sexual, and it is women who experience the pressures of capitalism in their own bodies in the greatest intensity. So their identities are crucial, they're at the heart Everybody else needs to listen, pay attention, because it brings into the open the true face of the system for all to see. I don't need to remind you, but let me do it anyway, that working people in the minority groups are experiencing double, triple, or quadruple exploitation and oppression. It may be a surprise, but this is part of ancient religious wisdom as well. And maybe this is the connection between religion and deep solidarity. The apostle Paul knew about this. And when he talks about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, where he, at the end of this description of the church as the body of Christ says, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. Or in the words of the labor unions, Saying the same thing uh, in slightly different ways, an injury to one is an injury to all. So here are the basic principles of deep solidarity. In the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you'll find that this is the solidarity in which God self joins. God is not neutral above, you know, watching from the top down. But God's the one who supports the oppressed and struggles on their sides. You can see this in the old exit stories that are common to all three Abrahamic traditions. In the Hebrew traditions, you find this miracle of the burning bush, where I would say the miracle is really not that the bush is burning and doesn't get consumed, but the miracle is that God self begins to hear and see the cry of the people and joins in solidarity on their side and a difference is made eventually. So deep solidarity then is the gathering place. It's the place of diversity. It's the gathering place for people from all backgrounds, races, ethnicities, genders, sexualities, and religions. Not just a matter of tolerance, but it is putting to work differences constructively. Solidarity is stronger when white and black Americans combine their resources in the struggle against justice, against injustice, obviously, right? Solidarity is not just follow the leader. It is struggling side by side without the need for uniformity or uniforms. 
There's also some implications for interreligious relations here that I want to mention briefly. In this form of solidarity, there is no need that all religions are the same. Buddhists may well be moved by different principles than Christians or Muslims or Jews. And there's no problem with that because we do not have to be alike. There is no need for uniformity or sameness. This is the basis for new kinds of interreligious relations that are a lot more exciting and constructive. You may realize at the end of the day that the person of another faith may be closer to you than persons from your own faith. And even the person of no faith, the atheist, may be closer to you than people of your own faith. I think we see this within Christianity fairly clearly today, where right-wing Christians are in a very different place from progressive Christians on the left, and of course from progressive people of any and other face on the left as well, including those who remind us that theisms oftentimes have been problematic. So it's a new way of putting together those who are different for a constructive struggle for justice. Now, there are a couple of worries about solidarity that I wanna mention in closing here. Some worry for good reasons that even if solidarity does not erase differences, does it let privileged people off the hook? I would argue that solidarity is the best place to deal with privilege. For those of us who enjoy white privilege, for instance, employing this privilege on the side of our black and brown friends in solidarity against exploitation can be productive in the struggle can actually make a difference. Rather than divesting, why don't you just make use of whatever privilege you have? Of course, if it, if it is productive in resistance, you can see the results in pushback from other white people. At the end of the day, and I say this from experience, you can't just go home again, but that may be a good thing. And hopefully by the end of the day, you've also learned that your privilege Whatever it is, white, male, heterosexual, you name it, doesn't always translate into power. And that true people power can only be built in solidarity. So solidarity then becomes a place, not just to bring people together amongst the threats and the exploitation of capitalism, but it also is the place to fight racism and sexism and to engage privileges constructively in order to deconstruct them those are just a few notes on deep solidarity, but the concept can help us see a few more thing, a few things more clearly. First of all, it can throw some light on who has an interest in sabotaging solidarity and who wants to turn the left into a circular firing squad. Of course, that's capitalism, it's the dominant powers. But ask yourself, what are the ideological powers today that sabotage the solidarity of working people and the 99%. They might seem progressive at first, even radical, but if they're sabotaging solidarity, there might be a problem. Likewise, this consideration also throws some light on who might have the greatest interest in building solidarity. It's not necessarily people who already have some power, but it is people who benefit the least from the system. Ultimately, it is these minority workers that we just talked about that have the greatest interest in building some power and changing the system. But don't forget all of the 99% who have to work for a living have some interest at some level, even if they don't quite yet realize it. So in conclusion, from what I have said so far, it should be clear that solidarity talk makes no sense without some conversations about labor, class, and socialism. It's not just an abstract concept or a pious wish, it's actually rooted in real life struggles. But the opposite is also true. Conversations about socialism make no sense without solidarity. Socialism dies when it is not developed in international solidarity. National socialisms are the exact diametrical opposite of socialisms. Socialism dies, furthermore, 
when it becomes parochial. And socialism dies when it becomes elitist. It's for all of these reasons that socialism needs to find new ways of engaging broad ranges of people. And this is where religion comes back into the conversation. Because socialism, if it needs to engage broader publics, also needs to engage and take seriously people's traditions. That includes religion. It includes an appreciation for these traditions. It also needs, of course, engagement, conversation, and maybe ways of shaping them so that they are more truthful and finding their own ways that lead to justice. I'll sign off at this point, but please feel free to drop me a note if you would like to respond or be in conversation about anything I said. For now, uh, thank you for listening and all the best for the rest of the conference.